Yeah. 
गोविंद मारे पुरुषम तमाम बचाने गोविंद मारे पुरुषम तमाम बचाने फेनुं क्रवंतम नविन्द दलायतक्षम परावतम सनसितम बुरसुंदरंगम कांडा पकोति कमनिया विशेष शोभम Govinda Mari Purusham Tamam Vajani Govinda Mari Purusham Tamam Vajani Alola Chanda Kala Satma Namaya Vamshi Ratna Gadampa Naya Keli Kala Vilasam Shamanti Bangala Litam Niyata Prakasham Govinda Mari Purusham Tamam Bajani Govinda Mari Purusham Tamam Bajani Agnani Asya Sakalaitra Yaviti Mati Pashanti Panti Kalayanti Jira
Jnanam Timirandasya Jnanam Jana Shalakaya Chakshuru Militam Yena Tazme Shri Gurave Namaha Jagurudev, good morning. This morning's Srimad Bhagavatam verse comes from Canto 10, Chapter 13, Verse 61. Tato dravyat pushpa vamsha shishu tvanatayam brahmadyayam param anantam agada bodam vatsan sakhin iva pura parito vin vichitana vad ekam sa pani kavalam param estya asha staha Then Lord Brahma saw the absolute truth, who is the one without a second, who possesses full knowledge and who is unlimited, assuming the role of a child in a family of cowherd men and standing all alone, just as before, with a morsel of food in his hand, searching everywhere for the calves and his cowherd friends. So this comes from the Leela, where Brahma is observing Krishna in playing with the gopas. And he sees Krishna acting like a normal child. And he's confused. And he thinks, this is the Lord of the universe. Why are these boys playing with each other? And why do these boys get to stand on his shoulders? And he he carries them around. Why is it like that? Why Why is it? the opposite of what we do, because we, as the demigods, have to bow down in front of him, and we always have reverence for him, and they're just playing with him. And Brahma was confused. And so there were no restrictions in their relationship with Krishna. And they were playful, and they shared everything. They would eat their food first, and then they would offer it to Krishna. So... He, Brahma was worried and concerned that Krishna had forgotten his divinity. And so he was under the influence of Maya, and he was thinking how terrible that was. And so he decided to take all of the gopas and the cows. And by taking the gopas and the cows, he put them away someplace where they were safe. And in celestial time, it was only a few seconds but in earth time, it was a year. And when Brahma turned around to look again, he saw that the cows were so adoring to their calves, and the mothers were so adoring to their children, and he thought, what's wrong with this picture? Because that only happens when Krishna's around. So he used his divine sight to take a closer look, and he saw that Krishna had multiplied himself to become every single calf and every single gopa. And he thought, how is that possible? All he saw were all these chaturbhuja forms of the Lord in all of these creatures. And it was then that he realized that he had made a mistake, that Krishna was indeed the Supreme Lord, and he came to offer his apologies. And so... I wanted to choose this Leela because of this idea of how Brahma got confused thinking he was the creator and therefore he was greater than the Lord. And I was thinking about how many times we think we're the creator of our lives. And we think, ah, I can manifest my life however I want. The law of attraction, I can create whatever I want. And while there may be some truth to that, really, what can we control? Do we control our environment? Do we control the sunrise and the sunset? Do we control the elephants? Can we change the weather? Can we change our family? As parents, can we change, can we really control our children? You might have a lot of influence on them, but really, do you control them? You might control what they can do physically, but you can't control their minds. I mean, we can't even control our own minds. So how in the world can we think we can control someone else's mind? I was just recently in America, and I was went to visit my aging parents. And 
in their age and their decline, there's less and less control that they have over their lives. And there's less control that we have over our lives. We, we, the kids, have over their lives. And I was really appreciating that as much as we don't want our parents to suffer from those apparently stupid mistakes that they make, they're just kind of like kids. And we don't have a lot of control over them. So if they want to go on a trip and they get lost on the way to the airport, what can, what can we do? I'm here in Germany, another sister's in Germany, another one's in Alaska, and they're in Phoenix. We can't do a whole lot for them. And so we try to help them. But our idea of help isn't so helpful in their eyes. And they feel like we're trying to control them. And in reality, we are. But we're not very effective at it. So we can't control other people. But do we control our body? Do we control when we're born? Do we control how we grow? Do we control what height we get to? Do we control when we die? Now, there might be some factors that we can contribute to that, but we don't control that. Do we control our digestion? Do we control our diseases? Can we control our senses? Only with practice. Can we control our emotions? Can you control when you feel this pride that puffs up in you when you accomplish something great and you think, aha, I have actually accomplished this by myself? Do we control that greed we feel when we see that big bunch of brownies and ice cream? Can we control how much we eat? Only if we remain conscious. And so it goes like this, that we really don't have very much control in our lives. So why do we think that we are the controller of our universe? In Guruji's uh, post, former tweet, on the 31st of March, he's speaking about the Upanishads and the philosophical texts of the Vedas, and he's talking about the Manduka Upanishad, which means to sit near the Guru, Bhagavan. And he's speaking about the states of consciousness, about how to connect the Paramatma to the Atma. And the first state he speaks about is Jagarat Ashvata, which is the consciousness of our thoughts, our feelings, our words, and our actions. And he said, in this state, Bhagavan gives us the power of choice the most strongly. So when we're conscious, we have this power to choose. We can choose how we live. But most people don't realize this. And that they live completely under the control of our instincts and our passions. And it's so true. Even after so many years on the spiritual path, I realize how much I'm really under the influence of these instincts and passions. I feel when I see an animal suffering or my parents suffering, my heart goes out to them, and I want to help them. I want to save them from themselves. And I'm not really completely living under my own control. I'm really just under the control of the gunas. And so in this state, there's this constant wrestling for control. I, me, myself, I can do better. I know better. And on the opposite side of that is, I don't want to be a burden to Guruji and God. So I'll take this on. I won't let him do it. I don't need him to take care of me. And that's just a, a different form of arrogance. So we never let the Guru help us. So in the next stage, the Swapana Avashta, which is the dreaming state, we're still under the influence of our past and our future and our desires. So we have these remnants come into our dreams. And we think we are in control, but we can't control our dreams. Not unless you're pretty advanced as a yogi. And so we're still trying to control the world. And once I had a dream where I was driving 
And all of a sudden, I noticed there was someone sitting next to me that had a steering wheel and pedals. And I freaked out, and I just was like, saying, Sri Swami Vishwananda, Sri Swami Vishwananda, Sri Swami Vishwananda. I'm stepping on the brakes and I'm trying to pull the car over. And I finally get this car to stop and I look over and the person is gone. And I only later realized it was Guruji. He was trying to take control of my car, but I wouldn't let him. And so it's like this in our dream. We're still struggling for control. And then Guruji speaks about this shush Shushupa, Shushupti, Ashvata, which is the deep sleep state. And in this state, there's no conscious awareness of any experience. And the mind and the body are in slumber. The mind calms down and it allows this deeper level of consciousness to take place. And this is where the regeneration happens. And he says only yogis can access this state. But he said also that this is where the Guru's grace can come in. And he visits us in our subtle body. He comes into our dreams, and he helps us with healing thoughts and feelings, and he releases this physical suffering in our lives. Through our deep prayers and aspirations, inspiration arises. And so I had some dreams yesterday. I don't dream often that I remember. And I had these interesting dreams, very short, but in succession. So the first dream was I was on my bed and I was looking over the top of the bed to underneath the bed. And in the darkness, I saw these two big eyes and big ears. And I was confused. And somehow I knew it was a deer. And I was trying to coax this deer to come out from underneath my bed. And I realized well, I'll tell you that in a minute. The next dream was I had a baby monkey, just a little tiny monkey in my hand. And I was so caught off guard. It was like a newborn monkey. And I thought, oh, he needs milk. So I'm trying to feed him with a little dropper. And I'm thinking, oh, that's not enough. And so I put him in a little cup. And then I fill the cup with milk, drowning the monkey. And I think, oh, no, no, I can't drown the monkey. So I pull the monkey out. And, and then... Another dream, shortly after that, somebody's handing me a tray with a Sally Graham on it, and I refuse the tray. And I wake up going, what is wrong with me? <laughs> because I realized that there was this deer under my bed, because Swami Akasha told a beautiful story about Bharat on Sunday, and about how Bharat had become attached to a deer. And I realized, after self-reflection, that I was hiding all of my attachments under the bed in the dark. And so how could I possibly let go of things if I wasn't even aware that they were there? So I realized I needed to pull them out from the dark under my bed, and I needed to come face to face with them. But because my compassion for a suffering animal leads me to want to take care of it, just like I wanted to take care of my parents, I was more likely to become attached to this deer, and especially the monkey. This poor little baby monkey couldn't do much on its own. So I was really trying to nurture the monkey. But what is the monkey? The monkey mind, the thing I'm trying to get rid of. And so I realized that I was trying to take back the things that I had worked so hard to let go of. And I was realizing that... I don't have control over what I do so much in my life, and I don't have control over my mind so much, but I can say no. I can say no, I don't want to t take care of this fawn. I don't want to take care of this monkey. I don't want to grow this monkey into a great big um, chimpanzee or a gorilla that I can't manage. And so the only thing I can possibly do is put it at Guruji's feet at Krishna's feet, and I can say, look, Lord, I don't want to play God with these animals. You are in charge. You decide whether they live or die, not me. And when I refused the deity, I realized that I was saying that these animals, this deer and this monkey, were more important to me than God. 
And I realized that was a huge mistake. And so I consciously choose to say, I choose God over my attachments. I choose God over my monkey mind. But in order to do that, I have to do my sadhana. I have to do my daily practice, chanting my japa, doing my kriya, and listening to satsang. And when Guruji wants to come into my consciousness, whether I'm consciously aware of it or not, he does that through the tur- turiya ashvata, which is the state that is beyond everything. And this is where he constantly dwells. He has complete control over all of those states, and he is conscious in all of them. And he has the ability to pull this state into our dreams to come to bless us in a way that we will remember. So as I said, I don't remember my dreams. And so the fact that I had, I actually had a couple more dreams, but I won't share those. I had about five dreams yesterday morning. And the fact that I was able to remember them was his grace. And I could see where I was making mistakes in my life. And that's his grace. And he can also manifest this state in our waking interactions with him so that we can go beyond our ever-doubting mind and we can know we've been touched by something very rare and great. And this is a glimpse of Bhagavan himself. So whether he's manifesting something or he changes the weather or he does something that just completely confuses our mind, and manifest something in a way that we see that he does have control over the elements. He does have control over everything, including our own dreams, which we don't even have control over. So he asks this question, what are we doing to help him with this? So it goes back to what can we control? So we can control how we spend our time. We can control some of our thoughts and our actions by the way we do our practice. So he's given us the japa, the kriya, our rituals. He's given us knowledge to show us what we can do and what we should be doing. And going back to another tweet of his that I love this line, it's about abandon the idea of controlling life. Abandon means to drop it and not go back. It means to just leave it where it is. So I have to leave the monkey where I found it. I don't need to pick it up. I can coax the the deer out from under the bed, and I can say, there's this forest. Go into the forest. Find your way. I don't need to hold on to them. I don't need to grow them up and make sure that they're fine and live. And I don't need to take care of my aging parents that are 3,000 miles away. I can just give them to Guruji, give them to Krishna, and say, Krishna Arpan, they are in your hands. I just need to focus on what I can do in my life to try and get closer to Guru and God. And only then can I, like Lord Brahma, see the absolute truth, who is without a second, who possesses the full knowledge and who is unlimited, as this verse says. Jai Gurudev. Namaste Narasimhaya Namaste Narasimhaya Namaste Narasimhaya Namaste Yeah.
Om Jai 
Shri Guru Yona Mahal Ariyo 